Welcome. Uh, my name is Lisa. I'm originally from Denmark, so my accent might be a bit quirky, and I apologize. I'll do my best. Uh, I have a background in visual communication, which means basically graphic design, print, a lot of animation and uh, video editing back in the days, but actually like no coding at all. I started getting into it self-taught because I wanted to do crazy stupid stuff in After Effects or I had my first uh, online portfolio card collective and I wanted to customize it. So just being able to do stupid stuff like that, I would go in and look at like different snippets. And that actually started me just using different like coding, um, different languages, and just using different forums to learn that way. About five years ago, I made the move from Copenhagen to Berlin. Um, in Berlin, I joined my first startup, where I started working in brand design, and I also started working in web design, so I made the transition from print to online. Um, and I learned pretty much on the job very quickly. <laughs> Um, I also learned a lot about uh, using design thinking and work processes and how that can work for not just designers but across different teams and that actually makes sense later on in my talk as well why that matters. And then in a little bit more than a year ago I joined IM. So IM is a creative premium not stock platform for video and images, basically um, the world's leading we like to say. We have about 52% uh, female photographers, users, and 48% male. Um, our biggest age group is 20 to 30, followed closely by 30 to 40 year olds, and most of our audience are in Europe and North America, and then followed by Asia, Latin America, etc. Cetera, et cetera. These are some of the images that we shoot. I don't know if you can see them very well through the light. So, yes, we have about 120 million photos available for licensing and more than 22 million engaged creators, and they are represented from 150 countries. When people come to IAM for the undeniable quality, they come to work with or be inspired by some of the most, in, most uh, creative photographers and videographers out there. IAM itself is pretty much still a startup. We operate a lot like a startup. We're a very small company, um, about 50, 60 employees don't, don't like, quote me on that, <laughs> but we're not that big. And we have some challenges, which are probably very common. Some of them being, um, there's a piece of interaction, users aren't really using it, can we change it on this landing page? Or we want to try out some different images here and there and see if that does anything different, especially when you are a photo-based company, if that really matters a lot. Or we just want to try test out some different CTAs, the language that we use, and see if that performs any better. What is typically the setup in a startup is that you rely on development resources in other teams, and if they are standing there with, uh, you know, either update the checkout flow uh, to include different uh, currencies or update a hero image, you can guess what gets prioritized. So what I'm trying to get at is that often marketing teams or growth teams are behind product; they lack the resources. And they might also be working in a completely different way, so they don't do sprints, they don't have the same kind of like work process that other teams do, and it makes it incredibly difficult. So what we wanted to do is that we wanted to move this from service to what we call self-service. We wanted to make sure that these teams could remove that dependency from other teams. And with Webflow, we found that we were able to work in a way that removes, especially front-end support. So what are typical needs for us? Uh, if we want to do marketing pages, like a home page, or if you have a content uh, home, like blog or whatever it is, can be campaigns, use activations if you're running contests or you run festivals, different kind of things. Um, also, if we wanted to try out new ideas, we want to maybe iterate on existing products or experiences, we just want to try out different things and talk about them internally. We might also want to test it and run A-B tests or just do an iteration on a product, existing product, and then try it out with users or internal stakeholders. Or in our case, uh, create a home for content, which is our online IM magazine. And I'll show you some of the things that we were able to build using just Webflow. So our homepage and our blog, our platform, our magazine. Uh, marketing, like product and service pages, 
also following the Westlaw campaign that we've run. And this one, which is actually ongoing, this is the world's largest photo photography competition that we host. Um, it had more than 700,000 photos submitted this year, and we built that entire product experience as well as just using Webflow. So, what works for us? Well, one thing that's good is that it's, uh, you can build a complete visual language that uh, sits across all your touch points within Webflow. What we built is that we started with a style guide and then we created a component library, and these are the ones that we use in everything. You can see just some examples here from the designer in Webflow. We also are able to define how they should behave during responsiveness, if there's motion, how should that operate, all these kind of things. And then if you reuse the components, you get that kind of consistency. Another thing we do is that if we use, here you can see one applied, we use what is called combo classes. So this is basically one component with some cards in it. And then using combo classes, we're able to use that one component, but still have different images used in the same card across it. So the other good thing about it is because we have a component library that we're using everywhere and they have the same classes, they mainly work like symbols and sketch or whatever you're familiar with, we can automatically update across the platform if we change the base component. So a good example is if we have like source of truth, we make a change from the source of truth, it updates on all the other pages automatically. The other thing that works really well for us is that we have a quick turnaround and there's almost no dependency on other teams. Um, some of the examples here is that using a component library, we're able to build, uh, you know, add new sections, build entirely new web pages, or use the designer to remove or edit or iterate on something. It's fairly quick, and we don't actually need anyone else other than the people using Webflow. Another way we can do it is that we also have editors, so they can use the editor to just go in and make changes to copy images, links, and then hit publish. And we also use CMS a lot, Webflow Zone CMS. So there we can create content pieces. One of the things that we're also working with is uh, using CMS collection where you create multiple templates. And then the, the thinking is that if we have different CMS collections that have different templates, a, anyone from the editorial team can go in and create a new um, item, a new <coughs> collection item, publish it, and essentially they're building a landing page straight from the CMS editor. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, so what doesn't work for us? I mean, this is true of everything, basically, but having a source of truth, is, it's hard to maintain and it's hard to build out across different tools, different platforms. One thing that is a big challenge for us is that we have different uh, workflows, uh, sorry, different WIC frameworks, but we have different style guides, and they're not, they're not connected. So there's an example of the one that we built in Webflow, and then we have one that is older that sits in React, and that basically is how our entire uh, web application is built. So the two product experiences look different, but they're still connected via our navigation, so it depends on where you're on the experience, they might look different. And it's, it's a hard thing to scale, and that's a challenge, I think, for everyone when it comes to system design systems. Um, the other thing, so I already mentioned a little bit, but Having multiple people with access to the designers or having multiple editors, it means there's quite a lot of risk of version conflict. Um, a designer can see if an editor is working um, in their editor experience, and an editor can see if a designer is inside the Webflow designer experience, but they might not notice and they might not even realize that the fact that they both have it open at the same time, it creates a version conflict, and so someone will not be able to publish. Or, even worse, we overwrite each other's work, so you can actually have spent hours putting in copy and not realize that it's gone because someone else published and they didn't have your work in their browser. That also happens quite often is that we have accidental publishing. Um, at IAM we have two uh, environments, so we have a staging environment and we have a live environment, and we have a very, very strict publishing process that it goes to staging first and then live, but if you're not aware of that as an editor and you're working in there and you just hit publish, you're pushing everything to live. And you might not know of a change that's being created right now the designer somewhere that wasn't meant to go to the production environment. So that's a big challenge for us. And then finally, with more and more designers or more people with access to the designer, there's also the risk that they're changing the base components, not understanding that this works like classes as simple as if you make one change, you make the change everywhere. So what is good can also be a huge risk. 
and then certain functionalities are just missing or lacking and there's definitely works around if you can do custom coding different things but every time you go in that direction or down that route you risk isolating the knowledge with people and so you actually create more dependencies so a great example is like here we have the designer it's fairly simple there's a logo in the top right corner i tap into it oh okay it's a symbol so i'm assuming it's a div but if I were to go in and double check it, oh, it's actually an embed, that means there's some sort of custom code in there, but how would I know? And then it's also hard to integrate, as I already mentioned it. If you have different development frameworks, it's kind of hard to just, how do you build out an experience? We found some work around some work using embeds here and there, but it kind of still feels a little bit hacky and we're working, trying to figure out how we can get there. And then another big takeaway has been that there is a tendency for our team to jump into build too soon, essentially. So what would before be, you know, spending time on just understanding the problem space, exploring design solutions or anything like that, there is a tendency because it's so easy to just jump straight into Webflow and that actually creates tunnel vision. So instead of exploring more solutions, you're spending all your time building that one idea that you thought was right. And then you might have spent two weeks building it and then realize that's not going to work and then you have to go back. So there were some problems. We had to learn the hard way, and then of course we also had to figure out well, how do we handle that as a team, as a company. And the first one I already like mentioned it a bit, we have a very strict design process. You start with the understanding, you have your requirements listed out, your goals listed out, you have all the stakeholders on board, everyone is agreeing, you might do some market benchmarking, sorry, uh, benchmarking some research. And then you go into exploration, where you might also still be doing research, uh, you're ideating, you're creating, and you notice that I put prototyping in here. We find that with the designers, if we force them to prototype outside of Webflow, they're much more likely to follow this process. If we allow them to use Webflow for prototyping, they're already in there, and so they stop exploring. So that's one reason why we put it there. And then only when you are fine and you have, okay, one or two solutions and everyone is agreeing on one, can you go to the create, which would be the build, test, iterate, and all of that would happen in Webflow. The other big thing for us was organization and a lot of rules around it. So we identified different kinds of needs, and I already mentioned them earlier, but marketing is one. So that, those we see as like permanent long-term destinations. Um, it could be a home, it could be a jobs page, it could be a power page, but it was basically a page that is meant to stick around. It might change the content, but the page is supposed to stay. Um, then we have campaigns. We identified those as a like, temporary, they might be repeating one-off activations, so as I mentioned, it could be competitions, um, you might be doing events, whatever it is. You might be doing an, an event every year, but you don't want it to be up all the time every year. And then prototyping. So, Again, we don't actually want the designers to go and use Webflow for prototyping, but we might still use it to test an iteration of an already existing product. So it's a bit of a balancing act. And then say along the same way, we also have to split it even further down and really identify. So things that are integrated into what we call the main project, which is our marketing pages, it's all one project. These are projects and pages that are meant to stick around. Um, they are also going to be automatically integrated into a live-facing experience. So there's nothing there. It's just the second you hit push, everyone who visits our page can see them. Then we have single temporary pages. We create a folder for those, for all the single campaigns in there. Um, and they have all the same components, they'll fit into the same URL structure, but they're not part of the main project. And a big reasoning for that is that we wanted to sort of reduce the risk of changing base components in the main most important pages, which is the marketing pages. So if we remove them from the project, it's not going to happen. And it's kind of okay if you break a few things in one campaign that's meant to just be up for a month and a half and then you realize it, but it's definitely not okay if you're breaking it everywhere else that's meant to be there forever and have a lot of visitors. Um, and then finally, we have the more complex multi-page projects. So similar, like, they are campaigns, they're not meant to be part of the main project for the same reasons. They might also be built differently for whatever reasons it could be, like maybe you make a stylistic choice or uh, you run, like we did the awards and we wanted the awards to be, sort of have its own like sub-branding, so it's built differently as well, has different components, but 
for all of those, we create new project folders, and then we upgrade those depending on whatever needs do we have. Like, how many editors are we going to have? Do we have CMS connected or not? But we create a separate project folder for them so that we also don't create conflict between our multi uh, page complex projects. It, it gets really tricky and technical. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but just to give you a sense of how that can look inside our dashboard is that we have our home. Then we have a folder with small, multiple projects inside it that are single campaigns. We might have a project folder that is just one campaign. Uh, then we might have a place that are just the prototyping of something that's already existing, but we don't want to risk breaking what is already live and available, so we separate it out. We basically duplicate it over. And then finally, hacks. And hacks are more the ones that everyone within the company have access and they can do whatever they want and they can just try different things out. Um, it might even be that someone from the sales team has to go on a call and they're trying to convince someone about um, an idea and they just want to show how it could look so they can quickly put something together using our component library. But we, again, don't want them to be messing up with something that's live and externally. Yes, so along the same thing, following a strict uh, published process. We actually have uh, identified three different ways of publishing, so we also have to have full sets around the three different ways of publishing. And we built, uh, this is the IM Design Studio that's also built completely in Webflow, and we use that to document how we work, essentially. So here's a good example, we'll do QA, so we'll use our staging environment first, then you have to test it, you have to test the change, did you break anything, you break any link, how does it look across the split for responsiveness, within different browsers, we use a virtual box to test if it works in uh, Internet Explorer, but if you have, then you can. <laughs> but we also actually have to make it a step, and we also have people within the company that whose job it is to run the QA, and they can support it if it's needed, but we actually want the people using Webflow to be going through this process themselves. Then, when, you when you've tested everything and it looks like it's working, we have a dedicated channel in Slack with everyone who has access to Webflow where we still have to ask, did anyone do anything that I need to be aware of before I hit publish? And then if everyone says no, it's fine, you go ahead, then they can go to production. So it's a bit of a, a, a process. It actually doesn't take that long when you get into the routine of it. It's like a couple of hours at most. Like if you've done the, the thing well and you built it correctly, then it takes no time at all. Um, and then this works really well for us because we've already managed to reduce our accidental pushes of something by a lot. The other part is changes from editors. So I already mentioned that, that when you're in the editor, you might not be aware that someone is working in the designer and made a change. And so what we identify here is these are the things that you can do. You can change copy, you can change images, you can change links. Anything else you need to do is not going to be possible from this, uh, from this step on. And if you want to publish here, you need to ask in Slack channel before you do anything. So it will save your changes, but you need to ask. Then CMS content. So there is like already the problem with the challenge with the dual publishing, which is it's great that you can publish CMS items without pushing um, you know, anything that's built in the Webflow designer. But if the people editing uh, the CMS content are not aware of that, then accidentally hitting the big blue button instead of the little orange button, it happens a lot. So we have to basically educate people. And it's basically use the orange or green button, never use the blue. That's the way to put it down. We've also explained why, because it's important that people understand what happens if you do it and what you do in that case. And then also, we had that question come out a lot. Oh, but it's not letting me publish. I get this weird like arrow that says something about publishing things are different. Da, da, da. That's the version that I was, like, I was talking about. So what they don't realize at that point is that somebody else has been working in the designer and there is a version conflict, and the only way to go around that is to go and identify who is working in Webflow in the designer, and can we publish to production, because that's the only way I can get my CMS item up. At least that's how it works for us. But yeah, so we document it very clearly for them, and you can see that back there. So also just telling them, what do you do in that case? And that leads me to documentation is key. So <laughs> that's the other bit. Like one thing is that if you're not a big team, it's as easy as like leaning over a table and talking to someone that's great. But you also want to make sure that it scales well and that it doesn't that knowledge doesn't stay with people. So while this might seem extensive, it's good because if someone wants to go on vacation, if they get ill, or even if they want to leave the company, if they can, the knowledge stays with the company, not the people. So that we go even deeper, we also explain how things are built. 
So here's a good example. This is the mapping architecture. This is what we call it. This is the logic behind it. Here is how our continuity structure is. Like, and this is different like levels of continuity. This is how you call it. So just all the terminology explained. Um, here are the kind of things you can find in there, and how are they set up in the CMS, and what's the logic behind that, and if I want to have a piece of content displayed in this big, uh, you know, news section, how do I do that, or what's the setting? So just explaining the logic matters to the editor, the editorial team, so that they understand what they're writing for, but even more so that they also understand, let's say, the consequences of, a, of an easy request. Uh, what will often happen is I'll get an editor come over and they'll say, well, I want my piece of uh, content to go in this one specific spot right up here. And it's like, yeah, sure, that's possible, but here's what happens. If we go that way, I can create a field very easy in the, CM in the CMS um, that says, you know, number one, and I can connect that piece in the design that says this has to display content number one. That's easy enough, but then what happens, like three, four weeks down the line, they want to have another one, and they just put that as number one. They don't understand or know necessarily that they have to go and remove the number one from the previous article, because otherwise you have two pieces of content that are combating for the same slot, essentially. And what happens is, depending on the refresh of the browser, you'll see either one or the other. And that's the kind of thing that they have to understand, they have to know the logic, and you don't want to have that knowledge sticking with just one person. So we document it. The same way we also document our component library. So even though in each project we have the component library embedded, we, we duplicate it, we make sure that it's there, so all the classes are there, and it's easy to just go in and copy paste, we also have them listed here. So you have a quick overview and also explain how you're supposed to use it. So in the case that I talked about before, we have a cart. You want to use this cart, you want to add an image to the background, that's great. You need to use a combo class because if you don't, you're adding this image everywhere that that cart is added. Those kind of things matter for people. And then finally, we do a lot to share the knowledge inside our own company and now here as well. <laughs> so just, you know, the learnings that we had were not always the easiest learnings to come by. This is what works for us. It might not be the best solution. You might have better solutions. But generally what I find is that the more that I talk to people, the more I get back from them as well. Like they have other ideas of how to do it. So it's a learning curve. <laughs>